Chapter 2 Slip, 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 go his oars as he dips them in Dawn's water. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, sounds his mind as he pulls the oars towards him, the handles worn by generations of fishermen, and then pushes them away so that the blades swing out, streaming cold. In the east there is pink on the water. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. On the transom, on a pad of old and frayed fishmeal sacking, is his pearl. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. The sun is above the ocean when he throws out his anchor and it bubbles down to the seabed of the northern channel, only three farm deep. The water is clear today, the green of yesterday replaced by the sharp grey of the seabed, the brown kelp and crowds of colourful anemone. He peers over the lip of his little boat, looking through the veil left and right. He will not see the fish, their thin silhouettes are hidden unless they turn and allow the sun to light them. But it is the shell beds he's after, mussel clusters that are a wash of black near the tide line, the paddler moon beds a brush of mottled white deeper down, clinging to the low rocks, and deeper still, hiding, sheltered by overhangs, the clam beds, the pearl beds, where he will find his bounty. He pauses in his looking, a shadow flits across the sand, gliding and turning. Eat, murmurs the boy, a smile on his lips. The sea lion turns on her back to look up at him, flashing her dog teeth. Eat, she grins, and then glides away. His smile turns to a frown, out here, just north of the island, where the continental shelf drops off to the deep ocean only a boat's length away. There are predators also. Many times he has seen a sea lion awash in the shallows, half of it bitten away, and once he saw a man reach down to scoop up a spork fist that had slipped the hook and lain just beneath the surface, exhausted, and pull his wrist from the water trailing flesh and bone. He shakes the thought away and stands up to let the new sun touch his body. He pulls off his old jersey. He flexes his arms, raising them high, lacing and unlacing his fingers, stretching all of himself as he once again looks down, scanning the ocean floor. There, at the entrance to the channel coming in from the deep ocean, just beneath the rising finger of the sentinel, a dark smudge on the sea floor. A clam bed, he thinks, obscured by the trailing kelp above it. Once again he lets the sun touch him, because down there it will be cold. He takes up his mask and places it over his eyes. He takes up his knife and clamps it between his teeth, and then he slips into the water. He treads there a moment, gulping his final breath, and then he dives. Cold, it encases his body, cold, a lens through which to see. Swiftly he swims down to the point where rock meets bottom at the base of the sentinel. Life springs up to meet him. What was an orange smudge above is now a giant anemone, its fingers trailing, and spiked purple anemones, and thick and fleshy kelp rising from their anchor to find the sun. He swims strongly, he does not like being in the water, he remembers the one-handed man's scream. Shivers wash through him as he kicks down and down, letting the pressure run through his throat and out through his ears. The drop off to the left is clearer now, the vast deep out there, the emptiness of it causing panic to rise in him. The smudge he saw from the surface crystallizes into clean black rock, a perfect overhang. He kicks towards it. And then his stroke stalls, a flicker just outside his vision. He twists round to study the bright jumble of the channel fear directing his hand to the blade between his teeth. Behind him the open ocean yawns, and the nerves in his back dance. Again he kicks down, and for the first time he feels the urge to breathe. The cold crushes down on him. The sun is so far away. Closer to the base now, he can see a smear of pink in the shadow, just as he had hoped. He smiles. Pink is the color of clam. And then again there is that flash on the edge of his sight. He spins to look, the whole world revolving with his turn. Nothing but the clear cold. He clenches his teeth now, the first convulsion pulsing through him. He has a minute left, he knows. Just enough time to make sure. The bed comes up to meet him. It is larger than he thought, and deeper, a tunnel into the rising rock. He hangs there on the edge of the shelf, peering in. A carpet of black muscle covers the mouth and sides, but deeper in he sees what he's looking for. He reaches in, 
wanting to touch and confirm the lip of the clam before he takes his blade and chucks it from the rock and rises with it to the surface and the sun. His fingers almost brush it, and then blue pulses within the black before him, and he realizes his mistake. These are not the shelled rows of a clam bed. Before he can jerk his hand free, a black finger lays itself across his wrist. Adrenaline explodes. He needs to rip his hand away, but the black convulses again, and this time a disc opens before him. The mollusk's eye regards him, and its finger tightens. Eat, says the giant octopus. He pulls, jerking from spine to hand, kicking his legs up and into the rock. Every movement reveals a new black finger with a power he cannot fight. Bubbles stream from his mouth. The cold crowds in on him, freezing his eyes, streaming down his throat. The great strength tightens, and again, convulsing, pulling him into the tunnel. Above him a school of spookfist turn, slivers of dark against his little boat drifting on the surface, and beyond it the bright sun. Life begins to leave him. In a rush, he understands. His time was brief. All of his days are gone, and this was always to be. Thank you. Thank you, mutters the boy, the words plopping from his mouth into a final bubble. Thank you. As his mind is enfolded in the slow peace of forgetting, he sees that flitting shadow again. It is rushing towards him, straight from the vast emptiness. Its impact shakes him. His synapses fire for the final time. All is confusion, for instead of the black eye of a shark, here is a green one, a clear eye the color of the water looking straight at him. And then he is gone. He wakes to the sound of dripping water. He is desperately cold. He can feel rock at his back. His arms are numb. He opens his eyes. Above him, faint sunlight dances through a hole in the rock. Where is he? Only his face is above the surface. All around him is the cold. What are you looking for? The voice is inside him. It is the voice of fishes. He looks about him, but all is gloom. What are you looking for? Just like the fish, the words begin as a feeling, peeling through him. But unlike them, these words are clear and directed at him. He feels heat in his foot. Something has touched him a long finger like that of the octopus. It burns and he jerks his foot away. Laughter. It chimes, soft, like the distant church bell on Sundays when he walks in the field. There is a mind in the water with him. You don't want to eat me, he asks the gloom. You are too big for me to eat. The boy remembers the power of the animal as it dragged him into the tunnel. Perhaps this is its cave. But this voice cannot be that of the monster. This voice is laughter. How can you speak? Again, that laughter. How can you hear? Again he feels the heat upon his foot, that whisper of a limb brushing over his. He does not look into the dark water lest he see horror there. I just listen, it says, this time speaking in the way of fish that only he knows. Come to me. He leans forward, wanting to, but he is afraid. What are you looking for? The voice is playful, tugging at his heart. A pearl. He puts his eyes to the water. Immediately she is there, her eyes just a finger from his own. They are green, flecked with all the colors of the seabed, and they look straight into his soul. Are you looking for this? Her hand appears, fingers tapered and unfolding around a bone-white palm. In its center is a pearl, just like his own. How did you find it? It's mine. I have one also. He slips further into the water, forgetting about the sun. It's on my boat. What is a boat? Both hang in the water, suspended between the above and the below. I know you. She nods, her eyes bright in the cold. She laughs, bubbles streaming from her mouth. He laughs too and reaches his hand out to hers. I've heard you before. I've heard you many times, laughing among the fishes. Why are you looking for a pearl? His eyes are dark and they pierce her through the water. So that I can be free. He reaches out his fingers, scarred from the line, and she extends her own. 
their palms touch, the pearl between them. Again he laughs, and the first bubbles of his new life plop from his mouth. They rise to the faraway sun. Suddenly her fingers tighten around his, and she pulls him all the way under. Wait! But she does not listen. With frightening strength she hauls him into the deep. In a rush they pass the opening of the cave. Eat, he hears a growl from the curling creature there. Eat, he replies, but they are already gone. The northern channel is behind them, and below the bottom has dropped off to fifty farm, a hundred, an endless blue ahead, and together they rush into it. Seven nautical miles out, seagulls swirl. Below them five ships are at anchor, their lines let out to a hundred and forty-two farm. These ships are bright with metal, bristling with satellite dishes, and are far from their native shores. On them strange men sit attentive, cloth across their faces against the bright sun, rubber about their bodies, and on their fingers more rubber, and their white lines cut sharp as they pull tuna from the deep. The ships have headed right, lying across and above one of the great summer schools. The men work at speed, dropping their lines. The dollies, the painted lures in silver, red, and neon blue, fall in graceful arcs before being whipped back. They trail upwards through the blue, their hooks spinning, and the tuna rise behind them, open-mouthed, and themselves go spinning to eternity. Blood from the gaffs leaks into the water, trailing in clouds as the tuna break through, and the dollies plop through the red fog like bullets. Beneath the spinning line, she and he dance, thirty farm deep, deeper than he has ever dived, as around them the tuna rise. Eat, she hums as the fish surge, her voice swirling in his mind. Eat, he breathes, bubbles streaming from his mouth. Eat, rumbles the great circling school, bunching up and then bunching down as the dollies spin the rays of the distant sun. She takes his hand then and drags him down. The light fades as they sink, and the bodies of the fish press in around them. Eat, these larger tuna moan, slowly circling in the half-light. Further down she pulls him, to where the light is gone and the bodies of the fish have grown monstrous festooned with light. Eat, moans the school down there, unmoved by the plopping of the dollies and the spinning of the young so very high above. A fish in the dark rears, a yawning mouth and endless teeth in a soundless clash as it cuts another in two, and two more eat the head, snapping it away before the light of it is dispersed, and there is nothing but blood in the water and bodies in the dark. And then a new sound runs through the deep. Hmm, it sings a vibration growing until the water around them shakes and a giant eye passes. Hmm, an ageless sweep of its tail takes it away, back into the black. She laughs, her eyes alive with the ocean's secrets. Eat, pounds the school. They are turning, he thinks, as the pattern of their one thought pulses anew. They will dive. She nods and spreads her arms while the water surges around them, and the school turns and suddenly is gone. Quickly she takes his hand and together they rise. On the surface the dollies spin aimlessly as the men continue to haul them aboard, wishing the tuna to return. She taps him on his cheek, her finger like fire on his skin. Then with a flick of her tail she darts forward, up through the water with hand outstretched, and she clasps one of the spinning dollies and turns with it so that the line cuts through the water and then snaps. Empty, it skitters up to the great shadow floating above. She takes his hand, and they leave the five ships far behind. Above, a man curses, clutching his hand to his chest. The finger throbs, blood leaking from the gash where the line slashed clean through the rubber and into bone. A giant fish, he says to his fellows, a giant! He pulls the cloth away and his face is foreign, his dark eyes slitted against the sun. There are no more tuna. The men stow their catch and wonder at the ways of this foreign sea. That evening, as the earth turns from the sun, she and he swim in the open water. Where are we going? She stops and puts her mouth to his, filling him with air. Home. Where is home? She breathes into him again, and again takes his hand, and they streak through the water, she with tail and he with feet born for this. The pillars and columns of the island return, so different from below. They glide through its channels while the water turns slowly to orange. A shashagasa passes them. 
and she reaches out and slips her fingers between the twin slits of its gills. She cradles it, turning in the translucent kingdom, holding it as it dies. She laces her finger from gill to tail, following the ridge of bone. Half of the white meat she places in her mouth, and the other she holds out to him. Eat. She puts the meat on his tongue. It tastes of salt and sea. Of her. It's warm down here, with you. His feet hang suspended in the water and underneath them her tail. She unfurls it, its fan spreading out until it lies flat beneath him. She brings it up to him, her fin touching his toes. She points to the surface, where only a pink glow remains. Look. She kicks once, raising them upward, and he sees. The same strange fish with its rainbow rippling in its scales. Nightfish, she says. She takes it by the belly, and the little fish relaxes in her hand. It floats with her, lulled by her touch, until she wills it and, as if waking, it waves its tail and is away in the growing night above them, swimming among the stars. His arms open and she swims between them. He holds her and she wraps her tail around them both. She puts her mouth to his and breathes into his lungs. They hang there, a fire within the cold. At dawn on a glassy sea, the boy's little boat comes gliding towards the beach. His strokes are smooth and long. The bow digs into sand. Smoothly he turns, hopping out and pulling the little boat partway out of the water. He takes two paces and falls onto the still, dew-damp sand, looking out over the lightning bay. Pink in the east. He reaches into his pocket and pulls from it his pearl. It feels like a flame. Again he looks out of the blue curve of the bay, still as glass. His smile mirrors the coming light. The sun, when it appears, blooms in his eyes. Thank you. Thank you.